Please all loose items in the pouch in front of you. And have a safe and informative journey. Hello, I'm Nathan Hartman, and this is Dream Finders, a podcast about the creative culture of Disney theme parks. You know, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to understand why so many people love Disney, but if you are one, it certainly can give you a unique perspective. Aerospace engineer Mary Kate Smith has worked for the likes of NASA and Lockheed Martin, but in her spare time, you'll find her flying through the stars over on Space Mountain. In fact, Disney Parks even played a key role in her graduate dissertation, thanks to Mission Space. But if you think that's nerdy, you you don't know the half of it, as Mary Kate also matched wits with chemists and bioengineers as a contestant on the reality TV show King of the Nerds. Mary Kate was kind enough to talk to me about her reality TV experience, the future of space exploration, and what kind of Disney theme park nerd she believes she is. All that and more is coming right up on Dreamfinders. Mary Kate Smith, thanks so much for coming on Dreamfinders. I appreciate it. Hey, Nathan. I'm excited to be here. I'm a big fan of Dreamfinders podcast, and it's an honor to be asked to be on here. Oh, see, now I'm blushing. It's just nice to have, it's nice to have people <laughs> that I'm fans of uh, be on who are fans of me, I guess. Um, <laughs> let's start uh, a little bit with a, a Disney Parks personality that has a big effect on you, uh, and that's Bill Nye. Um, yes, yes. Bill, Bill, of course, uh, as many know, was in Alan's Energy Adventure and, and is still uh, the disembodied voice in the queue over at Dinosaur. Um, right. What about uh, Bill Nye engaged you at a young age? What about what about who who he was uh, just engaged your mind? Um, so honestly, uh, Bill Nye, I remember being in kindergarten and first grade because they were combined classes. Um, in my public school, I went to in Mississippi, and I remember them rolling in, you know, those huge televisions, and that would be, and I, they would play Bill Nye the Science Guy, and so. Um, Bill Nye was definitely a big influence in, in early on in my um, my fascination with the STEM field, and it helped also that I had a grandmother who taught sci- uh, fifth grade science who mm. also showed me Bill Nye videos as well. So um, Bill Nye, uh, he's been kind of a presence throughout um, my growth as a professional um, throughout life. Now, do you remember when you first saw Ellen's Energy Adventure as a, at a young age, or was that something later on, or... Uh... You know, um, I started going to Disney when I, I saw my first Disney trip was when I was four years old. Um, and I cannot recall very much at four years old what <laughs> what I remember or not um, from uh, I, didn't, I don't recall uh, that standing out um, mm. other than, you know, I'm sure I remember like. The ma- of course, the magic and being, you know, four year old little girl um, at Disney World. That was always <laughs> just the magic in, in general. So um, I don't re- necessarily recall, though, Bill Nye. <laughs> um, but I, I assume you went to Epcot at a young age um, and that was sort of part of your yeah. trips. So was yeah. there was there something about Epcot and its sort of science focus that sort of influenced you as well? So a really cool story about Epcot, Um, I was um, going through Mission Space um, whenever I was going through my undergrad in aerospace engineering. And I was I was at that point in my life, I was finally taking time to kind of look at the queue because I understood what it was kind of (laughs) saying. And I kind of was at it. I went at it as a very critical eye, like, oh, let's see what Disney got right here, you know, and. Um, there was a particular word that they use about uh, arrow breaking and arrow bra- and I didn't know what that that word was in my realm. Um, I was like arrow breaking Disney. What kind of you know <laughs> voodoo is this that you're putting out? And so I went and started researching that, and that became a senior seminar project for me was uh, um, investigating heat loads uh, using uh, the technique of arrow breaking. Oddly enough, you know Disney uh, that that was what sparked that. Uh, I was looking for a project and. Me just in line at um, at Mission Space. That's what kind of uh, sparked the, um, that uh, investigation. So I was really uh, I lo- always have loved Epcot um, from the learning the uh, the edutainment aspect mm-hmm. of it um, and the future world. Of course, I, I um, was always fascinated with that. My my family were all big history nerds too, and so we were big fans of Spaceship Earth and whatnot but uh, i did think that um it was funny how uh mission space is what kind of triggered a 
one of my senior projects. <laughs> it was intricate, <laughs> intricate. Right. Now, let me ask you, though, uh, is it how accurate is Mission Space now that you've had time and papers to write about Mission Space oriented <laughs> things? How, how they like to tout it as, as something that would be experienced um, <laughs> But uh, you would know maybe a little bit better. <laughs> so the important part about Mission Space is what it provides to um, to young and old um, is the fascination of what it takes to get out there, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's important to kind of show what what the what the realism is because i think today we have become desensitized from space in a way spacex of course has helped a lot with getting people excited about space travel again um but i think that you know getting people you know in a cockpit and you know pretending to be an engineer or, or um you know a pilot i think it's so important and while the ride does need to be updated i think it's so important to have things like that that kind of it, it's such an immersion immersion um because it, it gets it gets kids excited about going into stem and fascinated and may, maybe they're not looking at the you know tiny details and like oh what is aero breaking but they might go and look up like what does it take to be an engineer um on a spacecraft you know so mm -hmm. i think um whether or not it's accuracy is uh is is a straight straight and narrow on the straight and narrow i think the important part is what it provides to um the people who who do experience it well let me ask you as as someone who uh is a you know a fan maybe a, a, a semi maybe more of a fan of the ride than some simply because it's sort of in your sphere um I, are you good at the ride or does it make you sick like everybody else? Are you, <laughs> does your science background somehow help <laughs> you not get like green when you're done? Well, I don't, I've never gotten sick on the ride, but I will say I do personally, I want to be an astronaut. Like I would, I would, I would do that. And I would, um, so in a way for me, if I got sick on the ride, then it would show it was NASA would know, like <laughs> they couldn't pick me to be an astronaut. So I, I don't know if it was sure stubbornness of telling my body, no, you're not going to get sick on this ride or, <laughs> or if I, you know. Or if I'm just okay in that kind of scenario. You know, I never thought of an Epcot ride as being, or any ride really, as being like, oh, well, this could make or break my absolute career uh, goals. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I, yeah, I don't necessarily go down, uh, you know, I don't know, Rio del Tempo or something and uh, think, uh, oh, I can't go to Mexico anymore. Because I right. didn't do well in this ride. So. <laughs> um, but uh, let's go back a little bit uh, to your family. You were talking about your family and... Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you mentioned that you're sort of history buffs and things, but uh, did, you seem to have grown up in somewhat of a nerdy family. Is that what you would say? I would definitely say that. My parents would probably disagree, but <laughs> if you if you tried to quiz my father on Lord of the Rings or Tolkien trivia, he would beat anybody. So he's a closeted nerd, <laughs> and all of their three children are very nerdy in their own right. So um, I I do think that we. Uh, we're a very nerdy family. We're very eccentric. I like to describe my family very much like uh, the Weasleys from Harry Potter. We're very <laughs> warm and welcoming, and and whenever we're together, it's just it's a crazy time. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Well, let me ask you because you said you grew up uh, in Mississippi, correct? Correct. So, so tell me about growing up uh, in 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 like loving Disney and going since you four, did you, were you guys a every year family? Were you uh, like uh, every couple years? What, what kind of Disney theme park oriented stuff did you find yourself gravitating towards? So um, my family, uh, we went, we went like every four to five years, I believe um, from what we could afford and stuff. And we, um, we ended up, trying out just different like we my father was, was the planner he was the one who kind of dictated what days we went where and then allowed us to, to decide what rides we wanted to go on um i was uh, up until um i was 14 uh, 14 i wanted to be an exotic animal vet you know so <laughs> whenever animal king opened i was all about it my parents bought me this big safari hat with mickey ears on it and I was uh, all about Animal Kingdom um, or whatever I was younger. But uh, so we 
Disney's been such a huge um, place. Walt Disney World in particular has been such a huge place for us as a family because we have so many family memories tied to it. Um, Crazy antics or stories. And what's been really fun has been watching. We have crazy stories when we were children, you know, and, Mm -hmm. you know, some of my brothers in diapers and and going. And then um, whenever I was a teenager to young adult to an adulthood right now. And so we just have so many. It's just been kind of a, a, a capsule for us where we can go and be like, oh, Oh, look at that. I mean, Disney's changed a whole lot, but we can still go and be like, oh, you remember when mom did that crazy thing in Norway, you know? So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you end up, of course, um, over at Mississippi State University for aerospace engineering. Right. And so how do you get from exotic animals to <laughs> space? There's not a lot of animals that we know of. There's not a lot of animals in space. So right. there's very little uh, connection there. How was that change? What, what, what made you decide on that? So what's um, kind of fascinating about that is I actually, I, I'm very fortunate. I remember the day that I decided I wanted to pursue aerospace engineering I was sitting in my 10th grade um, world history class with a guy by the name of Mr. Trunzler, had like a walrus mustache and just as pleasant as his last name sounds. And he <laughs> um, he decided he was going to sh- he's going to make us watch uh, October Sky, um, which is a movie about Homer Hickam who uh, was a kid that grew up in a coal mining town and developed rockets with the, with his friends. And I remember sitting in my chair and watching this movie be, and just saying, I want to be a rocket scientist. Hmm. And that's really what set me off. And I, I the throughout the rest of my high school, I took, you know, higher level maths and I took physics. Um, and it just kind of set, it set me off on the path that I'm, I'm on now. And it's, it's wild too, because if you talk to any of my, um, any people who knew me growing up in high school or middle school, if you, you ask them, what is Mary Kate doing today? They are doing nowadays. And they probably think, say, well, she's probably in costume design or theater or music or something. Cause I was very into the arts in throughout, um, throughout my, uh, schooling and so um so it's it's just been an interesting interesting path yeah for sure do you get to use the phrase rocket scientist is that is that a phrase you specifically i i, I am a rocket scientist is that something you get to say <laughs> i feel kind of like a jerk when i say it so i allow <laughs> other people to say it i will draw it because it is kind of it is funny to say well it's not rocket science to right. people Literally. whatever mm-hmm. you know right so it is fun to say that but i don't typically i just I say aerospace engineer (laughs) (laughs) to not sound like a jerk or pompous or anything like that. But if other people want to put that title on, you know, who am I? There you go. Yeah. (laughs) No longer in uh, costume design. She's a rocket scientist. Um, Well, let's talk about the the, the rockets, of course. You, you, at an early age, wanted to shoot off rockets. And that seems to be a a very specific, like, area or career choice. Was that always the hope of the career or, or... did you sort of, after a little bit of research, realize like I really love this aspect of, I don't know, space or or, mm-hmm. or rocket scientist stuff so, or like what what got you to uh, decide this is exactly sort of my line of thinking and what I want to do? So I think there's something profound about being able to be a part of space exploration, mm-hmm. um, regardless of what piece of it is, uh, we all kind of come together and do innovative things and creative things and um, take humanity to places that it's never dreamed of, right? Yeah. Um, so I think being a part of that is is something that gives me a sense of fulfillment. Um, and, be, and building rockets or being in rocket design um, and working towards that, it it gives me uh, like there's a quote by Carl Sagan um, somewhere something incredible is waiting to be known. And um, I, I've always, that's almost like a mantra. I always tell myself that in like the hardest times and hardest days of studying or hardest times I've had in my professional career, you know, um, going to space is hard and be, but I'm a, a part, I'm a piece of something um, bigger than myself. Mm. And I think that, um, you know, that kind of helped what that, that mindset kind of helped direct me to the area I'm in now. Well, let me ask you a little bit about, uh, MCU space Cowboys, which was a group you were connected with. Um, and, and from what it seems like kind of connects a little bit with what you loved about Bill Nye. Cause you got to speak with people. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, tell me a little bit about space Cowboys. 
So um, I, I was part of Space Cowboys for four years. Uh, two of those years, I was a project manager um, of the team, which was a lot less fun because I had to deal with budgets and stuff. So there's that. But um, the Space Cowboys was a really awesome, hands-on, undergraduate, fully undergraduate team. We built everything in-house for the most part. And we it was a eight-month-long um, competition that was run by NASA Marshall. Um, for the uh, at the time, they've since changed the name of the competition, but it was the University Student Launch Initiative. Mm. And so, um, what we did was we had to, you know, we had to do develop a proposal for our rocket. We had to build a subscale of our rocket to test it, to test our scientific payloads on board. We had to have design reviews that involved NASA NASA personnel, and oh, it led all the way up to um, to a big launch day with all schools across the nation from MIT, Georgia Tech, um, Purdue. We, were, we, we, we competed with all of these um, very prestigious schools, which being from Mississippi State, the MacGyver University that we are, um, <laughs> we did very well in, in these competitions. So it's a, it's a, very, a very proud piece of my, um, of my college uh, background being a part of it. But the funnest part that was um, the piece, there was a piece of the competition where we had to do STEM outreach education. And so we ended up um, doing like middle school launch challenge. So we would um, pair with uh, with middle schools um, to launch uh, rock, uh, you know, bottle rocket kits. Um, we would also go out to uh, public schools or private schools. We go out and talk to them about rockets, uh, rocketry. Um, my biggest uh, platform is is teaching the doability of rocket science and making it more approachable for uh, for kids and showing them what what is out there, what is what they're what what's all involved mm. within that within the STEM field. And so um, that was really fun. One of my the funnest years that we had uh, was taking. Um, we did like a YouTube series. It's really not good, but it's real <laughs> cute to me. I think it's precious, but. We, I, back in high school, I was really in a puppet phase. I loved building puppets, like the Muppet style. And I had this puppet that I still had, uh, had with me and his name was Robert, but we ended up renaming him Goddard and it was uh, Dr. Rocket and Goddard. And so they taught rocket science <laughs> to kids and, um, we would take Goddard to our, uh, to our rocket launches and stuff. And it was really fun, but it, it, Space Cowboys was a great, a great time. It seems like your experience in Space Cowboys and sort of, I guess, through presenting um, and the video work and all of that, it, it all sort of culminates in, I believe it was one of your college professors that suggested you try out for King of the Nerds. Is that right? Dr. Koenig was my, uh, was my graduate advisor and undergraduate advisor for, for college. And they actually, TBS ended up reaching out to him being like, hey, we're looking for young uh, young people who are excited about space and who are uh, in engineering and yada, yada, yada. And um, he sent out a group email to this, the team and he was like, hey, who wants to go to Hollywood? And I went and talked to him and I was like, hey, I'm kind of thinking about, you know, why not? And he says, <laughs> I mean, you kind of fit the bill, so why not? And so I did. And I, um, you know, I submitted my, I submitted a video and a questionnaire and you know, no kidding, got a call from that, like that showed up in Beverly Hills, California on my phone. <laughs> and I was like, okay, well, here we go. So <laughs> it was an exciting time. It was, a, it was like summer camp. <laughs> so for those who might not know, give us a little synopsis of what King of the Nerds was all about. Uh, Cause it was, it was on for, yeah. I believe three seasons on TBS. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah, correct. So, um, uh, King of the Nerds is a, is a reality competition show um, hosted by the wonderful uh, Curtis Armstrong and Robert Carradine. Um, both of those, are the, the guys are no, notably from um, uh, Revenge of the Nerds, if anyone has seen that movie. And um, Curtis Armstrong has also been in a whole bunch of other stuff as well. Um, but this, both um, Robert and uh, Curtis kind of came up with this idea of bringing people of all sorts of walks of life under the nerd umbrella um, and whether or not you call it a nerd or a geek it's kind of I, I get people being like well I mean if you like you know video games you're more of a geek and it's like well okay well we're all gonna fall into this one umbrella but yeah I mean having have, that conversation at all makes you a geek and a nerd if, if you, you want to come up with those definitional differences yeah no yeah so but we had we had neuroscientists on there we had a um 
we had, uh, you know, writers, we had gamers, we had uh, LARPers, we had, you know, just anything that you could think of that falls under a nerd umbrella. We had people that represented that. And um, what during the show, we lived in a house called Nerdvana and we were into teams and we had like team competitions and then um, it, whatever losing team had to vote somebody in and the winning team voted someone from the losing team in and they had a had a nerd off and the loser le- left left the left the house. So um, it was uh, it was like it, it, I just it's a, such a nerd summer camp. It was uh, a lot of I met some of my lifelong friends from it. I've um, I've it was a it was a really, really wonderful experience um, looking back on it. Did you were you prepared, though, for the the production end of it? Like as someone who had interest in that sort of stuff, were you I don't did you gravitate into the fact that there were cameras? Was it comfortable for you or was that something that you suddenly realized, oh, this is a much bigger like production and thing than I than I was thinking it would be? So I know this is this is like a stereotypical answer from anyone who's been on reality TV, but you really do forget that the cameras are there very fast. Mm-hmm. It's very bizarre. And we all, all of us from whatever background we had, all we just completely started ignoring them, you know, completely. Yeah. And um, so it, it was it was fun because it was like um, being able to uh, be creative, but also have a spice of, of uh, STEM involved into it as well. Um, so that was, uh, that was, that was part of the fun, I guess, mm. of that production. I, I really love, um, love the production team. They were always very transparent with us the whole time. So for the most part. And uh, <laughs> so um, they were, uh, if we had any questions about how anything was filmed or how anything was going to come across, you know, we would always talk about it. Did you go in, I, and I'm, I'm just curious of this cause I, 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 uh, another guest on this program, Evan Kasberzak, uh, was on a dancing competition. Um, mm-hmm. so you think you can dance. And so I've had conversations with him, uh, in the past too, about sort of, I, you know, you, you kind of find yourself juggling like what's going on and then also sort of what's edited in certain ways and, oh, yeah. then, and 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 your intentions and then the intentions of the editor mm-hmm. and then the intentions of what the fans think did you find yeah. and as someone who uh like i think it's fairly easy to say like you know your final episode has a little bit of drama in it it's you know it's oh it's, yeah more, you could say that yeah 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 <laughs> and and uh you kind of go out swinging in a great sort of way um but it it's it, like when you look back do you find that that experience uh, you were able to sort of translate what you wanted to be translated well through the medium of TV, or did you find like it was a harder experience to kind of, you, if you would go back, you would dance a little different uh, just so, cause you knew how the editors would think. Mm-hmm. So first off, I'll say that I am very fortunate. Um, I, that it was a, like, like how you mentioned my last episode was that I was on, um, was very dramatic. I was uh, in a very bad position with a guy that was not very kind to me on the show. Yeah. And um, but for those he, who know, like like yeah. like it's not. I, I kind of want to clarify because oh, yeah. it's <laughs> drama, but it's not like reality right. show drama. <laughs> like it's, it's nerdy more drama. Yelling at me, yelling at me to describe gravity in three seconds, and that's almost verbatim. Like, yeah, a quote. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah. It's just really so we're putting. Silly context to everything here right <laughs> For, on the reality scale of drama this is very this is not you know tyra banks passing out and and, and you know this is very low um right. but it's still drama <laughs> when you're in it so go ahead go ahead right right and so um i think you know the reason i went on the show to begin with was i i one i thought it would be a great time my family's motto is do it for the story mm. and this sounded like a great story um and two um i went on because i felt like it was a great platform for young girls to see a woman or young a young girl going through um engineering school and being a representative on television and so of course that's always in the back of my mind of being a representative and being a role model um and maybe maybe i'll meet some you know some girl or woman one day who's like i saw you on king of the nerds and i started looking up rocket you know Mm. rockets and how to be involved in that and um, so, and I know a lot of, uh, the other contestants that were on with me, who, especially with, with the science background went on for the same, 
same reasons as I did. And um, so whenever I came out of King of the Nerds and the overwhelming um, love and support from strangers uh, who reached out and said that they're, they're, you know, talking about their kids and their daughter, um, you know, how well, you know, I represented myself. And so whenever I go back and look at it, um, I, I'm, ple- I'm happy with how I represented myself on it, um, especially in a very highly stressful environment um, at the time. Uh, but if I were, I were, I, I don't think I would go back and change it mm. because it would change who I was at sure. the time. Um, but if I was to do it now, I would play the game as I should have and not been so my heart wouldn't have been so much on the table, <laughs> table <laughs> um, as it was. I, t- I think I took, you know, friendship is magic too close to heart um, on my first go around. And it is a, it is a competition show and I needed to be, play the game a little bit better, mm. but that just not that just wouldn't have been who I was then. Yeah. So. Well, and, 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 you know, there are good things that came from the show as we've already talked about, but like, you also got to meet Bill Nye, is that right? Right, right. He was, uh, well, he was, uh, one of the guest judges, uh, for the first show, which, you know, I'm still a little bitter that he didn't pick my team, um, <laughs> for, to win that challenge. A uh, spoiler alert, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but my team won nothing on that show, so it was okay. Um, but yeah, it was it was neat to see him in real life, especially, you know, growing up, seeing him, you know, from my, you know, uh, kindergarten classroom to uh, to to uh, universe, uh, universe of energy and everything. So it was neat to see him in real life and hear him interact with the other judges and stuff. So that was cool. Hmm. Uh, let me ask you, this is more of a question I have uh, when it comes to reality TV. Um, but so of course your, your time on the show is kind of short lived, uh, you're out at the third episode. Um, Mm -hmm. but what happens production wise? Do you, I know some shows you have to like just stay there. So no one knows who's out and then other shows like it doesn't matter because there's not like a betting pool. So it's not survivor. So like, what was it for you? Did you have to stay around or did you get to just go home? Uh, they sent me home, um, for like a, like a week and then I flew back, Mm. I believe. Um, for the finale, um, episode, but, uh, yeah, it was, um, you know, um, I'm trying to think what else, I mean, it, that's really it. They, they just, they flew me home and <laughs> see you, I came back. I, I probably <laughs> needed to see my mom to be honest yeah. after that traumatic experience. So like, I need to see my mom and cry to her a little bit and then like got my, you know, got it together and came back. <laughs> um, so it was probably good, but, um. I do think that one of the things about King of the Nerds, I think, is it's unfortunate that the show didn't come around a little like a little bit later and was on a platform like like Netflix Mm -hmm. or Hulu, because I I, I personally I didn't have cable. I had to go to my favorite bar um, that let me watch my television (laughs) show I was on (laughs) and we would have a watch party at the bar when it was on. So and most of most of the nerd community at that time were streaming. They didn't have cable. And so I do think that one, the show, unfortunately, I think it would have been a lot more popular if it had been on a streaming service where um, it was more available to other people, especially that demographic. Um, I can't tell you how many times people have like, has they, I, it casually comes up or my friends are making fun of me and someone's like, what are you talking about? And I'm like, Oh, it was on TBS. Uh, and they're like, well, what is it? And, oh, King of the Nerds. I've never heard of that. And I'm like, I know it was on cable. <laughs> so most people didn't have it. <laughs> um, something you sort of mentioned earlier, which when you were talking about sort of the dramatic events, uh, but also when you uh, discuss uh, sort of wanting to be a representation of uh, women in STEM, um, mm-hmm. have, you, have you as someone who uh, is nerdy and does nerdy things, do you find it harder for nerdy women to prove their nerdiness or on a, on a sort of a side note, but on sort of connected, um, do you find that to be the same in, in science fields as well? Do you feel like you've had to work harder um, to sort of prove yourself, even though you shouldn't have to? So um, I believe my experience has been um, it's been positive, but there's definitely been a it's been very hard because there are a lot of prejudices that even if they're not there's they're more of like subconscious prejudices Mm -hmm. that that um, I've had to deal with more. Like, I know this person doesn't mean it the way that they're saying it, but that's how it came across um, kind of thing. 
So within my time on King of the Nerds, I kind of saw the worst part of the nerd culture of calling, especially the women out on the show of like being a fake, quote unquote, fake nerd or, or, oh, you watch Big Bang Theory, so you can't be a nerd as silly as that is, you know, and it, it's, um, it's, I, I think, you know, being on the show, it kind of made me realize how much I didn't have to prove my, you know, prove myself to anyone, especially my altercation with um, the fella who uh, asked me what gravity was. I, you know, just like I had nothing to prove to him that night, I don't have any, and you know, just I don't have to prove myself as an engineer. Mm-hmm. I don't have to prove myself as, as a nerd either. I let my actions speak the loudest. And um within my professional career, I have had to navigate some, some hard situations because I don't want to be the girl that is too sensitive. And unfortunately that's the kind of climate that I, as a woman in STEM, I have to navigate is I want to call, call things out, but I also don't want it to ruin my career and I don't want to be seen as too sensitive. So I won't be able to, um, to request information from this person because they won't give it to me because mm-hmm. I was too sensitive. Right. Um, so it's, it's been, a, it's like, it's very much of a balancing act uh, being a woman in STEM. I do think it's getting better. I don't, I wouldn't say like, I think I saw someone on Twitter the other day uh, that was saying, well, you know, um, women representation is so much better in engineering now, you know, than it was 20 years ago. And I'm, and I was like, I, I graduated from engineering six years ago and I had, I think three other women in my graduating class, Mm -hmm. you know? So in my freshman year, I had out of a hundred students, there were eight women in the class total. So, you know, it's, it's still, um, and so I think that's, that's why women in STEM, it's so important for us to get out there and um, and to break those barriers and show that you can you can wear makeup, you can dress nice and you know fashionable, you can um, sound girl, you can get your nails done, you can get your hair done, and still be an amazing engineer that's contributing to the cause, right? Mm. And um, one of my best friends in the world, um, she she and I started aerospace together. Her name is Paramita Mitra. And she was Miss Mississippi 2013. Um, So she did pageants. She is currently the PI leading um, the next generation, next spacesuit, next generation spacesuit head up display Mm. um, uh, technology. And she is, she's the one who kind of, and really showed me um, how to uh, find that synergy of being a girl and being an engineer because I going into it I had this mentality of I got to be one of the guys I have to um, have you know I have to cuss a lot I have to be crude I have to you know um, you know get down it, it, I don't know it's just it's weird the vantage point I was coming into thinking I had to dress down um, you know just so I wouldn't be intimidating and I think Pyramida is a beautiful representation for women in STEM and how she represents science and um and be, being feminine in that space um and giving that empowerment to young women because I I can't tell you um how many times we've gone out to whenever we were in Space Cowboys she was also in Space Cowboys we would go to classrooms and her just talking about her experience being in pageants and also saying that she was also an aerospace student um, brought more attention from the girls in the back. that just were like, I don't care. I don't care about any of that. Mm. So why, but, but as soon as she said that she did pageants and stuff, Oh, really? I can do both. Yeah. That's, that's the important thing, right? Is, is showing that there can be a, a synergy of both. Hmm. So uh, you, you end up leaving King of the Nerds. And as you mentioned earlier, uh, which is interesting, because when you leave the show, you mentioned that Carl Sagan quote about, you know, there's somewhere something incredible is waiting to be known. Um, Mm -hmm. And, and I guess the question is, what, what was the next thing that was incredible and waiting to be known? What did you have a goal for yourself at that time? Did you already have a job lined up? Did you know what you were going to do? Well, I wanted to go to grad school. So um, I, that was what I was finishing up undergrad when I did King of the Nerds. Mm-hmm. And so whenever um, I knew my career path that I wanted to be on, I needed um, a master's degree at least. And so um, I ended up doing I did a really awesome um, thesis uh, project um, that was that was really fun to work on. Um, 
I am a really big uh, David Bowie fan, so I got to even have a little shout out to him. Uh, my thesis uh, was called A Concept Study for an Extraterrestrial Sea Exploration of Titan uh, via Deployable and Versatile Instrumented Device Buoys. So that a- <laughs> um, acronym stood David Buoys because I'm, my professor thought I was crazy for it, but I, I loved it. So. <laughs> we got to have fun, you know. I know, yeah. And also, we in science, we only speak an acronym, so <laughs> it worked out. Um, so eventually, of course, you end up, and what I would imagine be, I guess would be sort of space nerd uh, like Mecca, which is Houston. Um, mm-hmm. Tell us a little bit about what you did in Houston as a flight controller. Sure. Uh, so I worked as a uh, mission operations planning flight controller. We uh, acronym that to ops plan. Pretty easy. There's a lot more complicated ones on on, on mission control. But uh, so I supported the astronauts on board um, the International Space Station, which included creating um, plans and implementing plans out to the flight control team. Um, we would, we were probably one of the most integrated, um, of the flight controller teams because we had to talk to every single, um, every single group if they wanted an activity that the astronaut needed to do, or if they needed certain, um, certain communication lines open, um, all, all of the above. And so we were constantly uh, on, we call it being on the loop. So we have, we have, uh, earpieces in and we're constantly listening in the background for our, for anyone who's calling our name. And, uh, it was, it was really fun. It was a very fast paced environment. It was, uh, really cool to get to work at mission control, uh, historic mission control. Mm-hmm. Um, just, uh, the floor above was where, uh, Apollo mission control happened. So that was really, really neat to be in such a historic place. Um, especially one that, um, inspires so many, including myself. Um, I also got the opportunity to, uh, to work on the commercial crew program and developing a tool to certify um, our commercial crew uh, vehicles such as SpaceX and Boeing. And so that it was just a really fun, fast paced environment. And of course, being surrounded by space is just, (laughs) is just awesome. And now of course uh, you are in Florida and you work over uh, at Lockheed Martin and I'm sure there's plenty. You cannot tell me about Lockheed Martin. (laughs) Um, And uh, though I, I don't think that, CIA is listening. Um, but uh, what I would ask is, you know, what sort of work occupies you uh, now that you're on the other side of the coast uh, over uh, working at Kennedy? Yeah. So currently I am supporting um, the fleet ballistic missile program on, with Lockheed Martin. I So what that means is I um, I support the Navy fleet, uh, submarine fleets on East and West coast. Um, they house our Trident missile on board them. And so if, if anything weird pops up or anything like that, we we're kind of like I like to describe us as kind of like the IT of the missile. So <laughs> something seems off, they'll be they'll call us up and we have to help them fix it. And we have to you know either either we have to fix it, we have to have always a rationale yeah. um, for whatever we do, whether it's we just leave it alone. We have to have write a whole memo for it, you know, just ev- everything. So you don't so, just tell them to um, turn the switch off and back on again. So you have that help. <laughs> I, I won't say that that hasn't happened before, but there has been a, one instance where that was that was kind of, that was more or less what I basically told them to do. <laughs> but um, yeah, it was a it's it's a it's a really fun uh, fun environment. Lots of really cool, interesting people, especially working with Navy personnel. Um, whenever we uh, were doing um, any do- docking or anything, so I get, I've gotten to be down on the submarine, um, not while it's been out out of dock, but I've gotten to be on board and stuff, and so integrating with that kind of uh personnel is always fun um luckily my dad is a he retired as a one-star general so i'm used to that kind of personality Mm. (laughs) (laughs) so uh so it was easy for me to pick up what whenever they're heckling too much well let me ask you a little bit about kennedy because um Mm -hmm. uh, and and we'll talk kind of from a theme park perspective but i I would love your angle on it um i find kennedy as a place to go visit sort of fascinating um, in mm-hmm. the sense that it's it's both engaging, but also I think a little messy. Um, it, it, like in my experience, I sort of was like, well, where am I? And like what the narrative is a little hard to follow. Um, but I'm curious right. about you as a theme park uh, person, because there's certain things I love there, like the, the Apollo show um, and things like that. Um, but w- from a theme park perspective, what, what do you like uh, about Kennedy? So what I like about Kennedy is... Um, 
it's kind of in a way why I loved working at Mission Control was that there was, you know, even though we had tour groups coming through, this was where real, 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 real science happens here, right? <laughs> um, this they, this thing that you're looking at went to space. How cool is that, right? And um, I think it's all about, um, unfortunately, you're right. Uh, I do think most, a lot of our visitor centers, they, they do um, struggle with like, having that narrative and and some of it's uh, in all i've been to quite a few of the visitor centers throughout um throughout the united states and some of them do better than others and there's some exhibits that are you know need to be kind of um updated but so does disney (laughs) but um you know i think it's all about um who you go with too and Mm -hmm. if you if you as long as you have that one person that's with you that is that is um, drinking the Kool Aid and excited. <laughs> it's it can be it can be so immersive and such an ex- a fun experience. I I loved going to Kennedy. I haven't been you know since I've moved here, which is unfortunate. But um, so it's been a while. But I loved going and touring um, the uh, vehicle assembly building and just going to see the countdown clock, um, which I got to watch the last space shuttle launch from the countdown clock, mm. which was cool. Um, and so like, I don't know, there's just, for me, I think space is cool. And so everything there has history. And I think history is incredibly impactful and incredibly empowering, um, being in the field that I'm in. And I think it's empowering, even if you're not in the field, right? It's, um, I think there's something to be said about merging, um, left and right brain people and understanding that it takes both to, to get to Mars, right? So, well, let me ask you about that. Um, mm-hmm. Are we gonna Are we gonna get to Mars in our lifetime? Well, if I so, I suppose you have a corporate answer, which is yes, of course we are. <laughs> well, we've already been to Mars, in my opinion, true, because true. robots are easier than humans. Humans are a nightmare in space travel. <laughs> and they, I, I took this. Uh, this is a sidebar, but I took a class. My senior year, it was a uh, spacecraft design one, which was the fall. We created a spacecraft. It was really cool. We had a great time. We we walked. Our professor walked in um, spacecraft design two. And was like, all right, you need to take that spacecraft and put people on it. <laughs> it was a nightmare. <laughs> it was a miserable experience. But um, so uh, saying all that, I do think that in our lifetime, it is completely possible. Will we in the political realm that we live in, will we be able to get there? I don't know. Um, It kind of goes back to what I mentioned before about desensitization of space travel. A lot of people, I think, while CGI is so cool, right, and we see Guardians of the Galaxy where we go to space and do all the space travel, I think it desensitized kids and I think it desensitized people. Like, okay, cool, Mm -hmm. space it's, it's really pretty, but why do we need to go there? And so I think it's just about, um, I think NASA outreach needs to do, um, more in, uh, you know, in educating people, um, that they still exist. I still get that question, um, that they're still, the doors are still open and that how cool it will be to send people out there. Our commercial, um, like industry developments, things like SpaceX, are, are, do you think that is sort of leading the marketing charge for a lot of this stuff? Because I do sort of feel like NASA as a whole, and I love NASA, don't get me wrong, um, but NASA as a whole is sort of like, hey, remember Apollo? Like that's sort of right. been their thing for decades. Um, and I'm never sure what the future holds beyond we're going, we're doing. Mm-hmm. Um, here's Buzz, he'll mm-hmm. tell you. Um, yeah. So. <laughs> He's a yeah. <laughs> so I, I guess my question is like, do you, when I see like the sexiness of a SpaceX cockpit and I'm like, oh, that's, that's, yes, that's science fiction. Like that's the future. Right. Like, oh, right. that's right. what goes to, to Mars. I get it. Cause I'm so used to seeing like, I don't know, Ryan Gosling, like in, in the old shuttle in the movie or whatever. And, and it's like, that's great, but it's hard to sort of get that, get that, I don't know that push to get people to go. No, no, no. There's, there's more to do. There's more to see. There's, there's, and we can do it, and it's cool still. Um, do you think that like SpaceX and marketing people are helping push that and and helping in in a way marketing is needed to do the jobs that you do um, in that way? Is that helpful? Right, right. Absolutely. I do think. Um, 
I think SpaceX is, is in particular is doing a great job in getting people fired up about space again and getting people to go out to launches and droves again. Right. Um, we're, uh, I think that also SpaceX is showing how science sometimes has to be done, which is very fast and you're going to fail a lot, but that's part of discovery. We're going to fail. And unfortunately, NASA has a lot of unfortunate weights tied yeah. to it that they risk mitigation and safety is no is safety is priority number one involving an astronaut and people. Um, you can just look at the history of the space shuttle program in the NASA shut its doors, you know, twice because of a, a tragedy. Um, and unfortunately, we lost a lot of, you know, momentum for the space industry because of the shutting those doors, because they had to stop everything and figure out what um, what failures, uh, how, how did this happen? How do we avoid it from happening again? Granted, 100 percent have to do right. that. But we have sometimes if you got to go while the iron's hot. Right. And space is hard. Space is dangerous. And it's it's one of those things that if you're not committed to it you know you're not you're it's, you're gonna it's gonna be a slow burn mm. right and and i think that spacex i worked i have done a little you know i've worked a little bit with spacex they are very fast and um pedal to the metal commander uh yeah. type of mentality and um while that's scary from a nasa personnel <laughs> point of view um from a you know want to see something in my lifetime point of view heck yeah, yeah. Go spacex let's go you know take us to mars right I assume, but yeah. i i am worried about it right yeah because that human lives are involved well and i assume that's the difference between um acting like a like a tech company and acting like a government you know subsidized 100 mm, corporate yeah yep. um let me ask you about uh, something completely different, um, which mm -hmm. is, uh, I, I don't really want to call it a hobby. I want to call it more of a life practice. And maybe it's when you take up um, uh, because uh, of your desires to be an astronaut. But you are uh, pretty open online about uh, your your weightlifting and, and your goals in that mm -hmm. sense um, and yeah. doing all of your exercise. And why I ask is, is I was curious if you approach exercise in the same manner you approach science um, or other nerdy stuff? Is there a, a scientific mm -hmm. method for you for exercising? Um, or do you think it's been easier or harder because it's a different sort of uh, left brain, right brain process? So I think human beings are human bodies are incredible. Um, it is a, I've, um, I started doing CrossFit a few years ago. Um, and that kind of got me into the, the fitness uh, fitness craze and um just obsess obsessing over like how to get stronger and it wasn't for me it's never been about losing weight it's been about being stronger and healthier and i think um i guess in a way in a nerd i've never really thought of it that way but yeah on, on the nerdy you know science piece what fascinates me is seeing the development of like okay well if i this is my nutrition this is feeding this and if i lift this this day, I can't lift, you know, mm -hmm. it's a lot of negotiation with my body and how, how it, how it responds to certain things. And, um, so in a way, I guess, yeah, there is like a little bit of a nerdiness to my weightlifting <laughs> that I do that, that does fascinate me and why I continue to be passionate about it. Um, as someone who is a part of a lot of nerdy culture stuff, uh, here's a, here's a question sort of about this. Um, you know, You've had you've had your I guess your toe dipped in a lot of different nerdy realms, um, and in fact you've uh, you know pushed to be the king of the nerds. So, um, <laughs> what is your take on Disney theme park nerd culture? Um, it's always a fascinating and complicated culture, <laughs> but I'm curious right. about your thoughts. Is it less or more passionate than other nerdy cultures, or is it is it very much like everyone else's nerdy cultures? Quite, I think you know. If you're passionate about anything, you're gonna, you know, that the those are nerds, you know. <laughs> and I think every realm, like whether you're a comic, I, you know, I've delved into comic book nerds, and it's the same kind of culture that's around. You get the 
get the really, you know, detail oriented nerds about this one thing, you know, and then you have just like the passive fan or whatever. And I think the, you know, I have this, I wish I could remember the comics name, but anytime I see any argument on like my Facebook or anything anywhere online, one of the, co- there's this comic that I use that I just post because I don't feel like arguing with them. <laughs> it's just, it's, it's just a comic that goes, shh let people enjoy things. Right. <laughs> and that's, that's kind of my general, uh, I just, I in general view on, on any kind of um, nerd culture that I'm a part of. Um, and the Disney nerd culture, they're very passionate. Um, I'm living in Orlando that uh, the last year and a half that I have, I've kind of dealt a little bit further into that rabbit mm-hmm. hole and realized how passionate some people are. But, um, you know, overall, there's nothing different than uh, that sets Disney fan culture apart from a co- like Marvel fan culture, in my opinion. Mm. You know, you know, Disney fans are going to hate hearing that, whether it's true or not. Oh, I know. <laughs> They're every, you know, everyone is different. Everyone has a little gold star. <laughs> <laughs> um, but let me ask you about your own Disney theme park nerdery. Um, I find that there's mm-hmm. sort of two camps, right? There's, I would say, the more conservative theme park fan. Um, the park is a place where certain things can't be touched. Um, and, and then there are the more progressive theme park nerds who are pretty much okay with anything being replaced as long as it's replaced with something better. Where do you find yourself in that spectrum? Ooh, it kind of really depends on which, which ride or area you're talking about. Cause if you touch carousel progress, my heart's going to break. <laughs> um, uh, I, I think there's nothing wrong with improvement. And I think that actually, with the tech that we have these days, I want to see what the Imagineers mm-hmm. come, come up with, you know, cause I think again, I think I mentioned before, like I love, I love seeing left and right brains work together and create something really fun, creative, innovative, um, new technology. Um, I love seeing new patents come out uh, for ride vehicles. You know, I, I think it's just, so I guess I fall more into like, I, I'm not afraid of change. Mm-hmm. I'll be okay, but don't touch ter- carousel progress, please. <laughs> we, we can make adjustments. I, uh, let's, let's agree that we could probably make adjustments about car phones and things. Right. But yeah, I agree. Let's leave it. Let's maybe give it a little love. Right. We could get a little love and just like, up, maybe, and you know, I'm okay with a little updating. Just don't get rid of it. You know, I just keep the soul that's there. Um, do you have those same fears for Spaceship Earth? I, I do and don't, I think, so Spaceship Earth, I, I love Spaceship Earth. It's a, it's a family favorite of ours. Um, we, I, I think that there's something incredibly great about the edutainment in that short ride that gives you a, like, just, I just love how they, how it's laid out. I think the animatronics are beautiful in it. Um, I'm, I think that the story does need a little, needs some updating, mm. but I hope that, I don't know. I don't know what to expect with that. <laughs> um, I, I think, I know it needs it. So I'm not upset that it's good. It's, you know, getting done. I just am nervous about what's going to get done. <laughs> well, let me ask you about Epcot as a whole. Um, do you mm-hmm. find, uh, are, I guess I should say, are you wary of the more IP heavy, less, I mean, I don't know if I should say less education, yeah. but it, it, I mean, they're trying. It feels that there's way. There's been there's been moments where they've been like Finding Nemo is still being education, and then there's other moments where they're like, Ah, no, this is just Ratatouille. Um, right. Do you are you worried about that? Does that bring hesitancy, or do you think this is a wise move for the park? You know, I I am hesitant to say um, that. I understand. I so I do understand their reasoning for it because you know i remember being a kid and my favorite thing to do was go was going around the world and learning about the different cultures while i'm sure my parents loved it too um for different reasons (laughs) but um you know i don't i don't know if i i I feel like taking away the edutainment and trying to shove an ip in there it's just like it's just a shame um because i think what I hate to see is dumbing down something for people. Mm. And I, I feel like shoving an IP in there, I I think you'll lose some of the inner, uh, the education pieces of it. And I, I wish that they would concentrate more of the education. Let's, let's make this fun. Like, let's up, like, why don't we, you know, 
update mission space in this uh, like a more with higher tech but still keep the story mm-hmm. you know where you're you're going to, to deep space and going to mars like why do we have to shove some something else in there right i don't know i um so i guess in a way i do i'm just like everything i'm cautious i i do know that things need to be updated it's it's just you know part now that's what i call progress <laughs> but you know but um I do hope that they keep in line with what edu- uh, like Epcot to me always felt like was the center of, of edutainment mm-hmm. was um, kind of in- educating kids and adults alike. Um, so I hope that they, you know, kind of start bringing, I, I went to Epcot recently and I missed all the cultural representat- re- representatives because mm-hmm. it feels like a lot of the heart and soul was missing from Epcot. Yeah, yeah that's so true. Well, uh, as we finish up here, I thought we'd do a little Disney mm-hmm. nerd lightning round. Um, just a, f- oh. a few questions. This is, uh, we'll see. There's no right answers, just your favorites. So, right. okay. uh, favorite park character that can be anyone from Mickey Mouse to some obscure character. Mm. Um, I would definitely, Mickey is always my favorite. But I saw I, I love seeing Max on the cattle clave from Goof Troop. <laughs> he's like he's, I always get so excited when I see him. On you the weren't one of those girls that had a crush on Max, were you? Oh, one hundred percent. There is no doubt in my mind. <laughs> no, that's a whole generation, so that's totally fine. Um, uh, favorite ride? I hate to be stereotypical space nerd, but I really love Space Mountain. <laughs> I you know I I guess that's sort of. I would say Mission Space would make you cliche. Space Mountain's so different and out there. Yeah. Uh, unless you yeah. know more about space, you know more about space than I do. If 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 you sit kind of, you know, that way in a little rocket and spin around the the stars, that's cool too. Um, <laughs> I just I love I love the darkness, and I, I I also have a lot of wonderful memories laughing at my mom <laughs> screaming throughout the ride. So uh, <laughs> that part of, part of it too. Uh, favorite snack. Dole Whip. Mm. Especially with a little rum. Oh, there you go. There you go. Yep. Um, which uh, you can get Animal Kingdom, just for those yeah. who don't know. Um, I don't know if you can right now. Who knows what you can get during uh, the pandemic. But, I know. Um, Is that the truth? Uh, favorite show. So this would be any sort of, this could be performers or animatronics. Well, I've, obviously I've mentioned 8,000 times during this yep. podcast already. Is I love Carousel Progress. Uh, and finishing up here, favorite park. See, I knew you were going to ask this question, I know, I know. and I've been, I've been thinking about it for a very long time. But the parks have changed so mm-hmm. much throughout the years, and so I, I will, um, I will have to say it is still probably Hollywood Studios, but it's a real, it's, it's kind of a toss up now because Animal Kingdom has grown on me so much. Mm-hmm. I just love old Hollywood stuff, so. There you go. Well, it's still there for and now. Star Wars. And you get and you end Star Wars. Stars will be there. I, I am a big Star Wars fan, so I can't like let that. Please, <laughs> I know people are hit or miss on Star Wars land or a Galaxy's Edge. So. Well, Mary Kate Smith, thank you so much for coming on and being nerdy with me here on Dreamfinders. I really appreciate it. No, Nathan, thank you so much. This was super fun, and uh, I appreciate you asking me on. And that's it for this episode of Dreamfinders. Thanks so much to Mary Kate Smith for chatting with me, and you can keep up with her on Twitter at timelord underscore mk dreamfinders is edited by shannon mickelson with quality control by ben harris it's hosted and produced by yours truly nathan hartman who you can follow on twitter at some stuff i said our podcast artwork is provided by jp tanner find his other work at tanwoodcreative.com this podcast is distributed by wdw news today the worldwide leader in disney parks news read all they have to offer at wdwnt.com Tell your friends about the show and please give us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. It means a lot and gets the word out. Also, if you or someone else you know would make a great guest on this program, feel free to email us at dreamfinders at wdwnt.com. I'm Nathan Hartman, and remember, if we can dream it, then we can do it.